Hello, everybody. I'm here with Ness Sandoval from St. Louis U. We're going to start in a bit. Give us a few. <laughs> Give us a chance to get ourselves. All right, I think, we, I think we're good? both in there. Do you want to back any further? I think we're good. Okay. I think we are. Yes. Yes. We're awesome. It's Tuesday. Thank goodness it's raining today and didn't rain yesterday. <laughs> That is a fr that was me. I, I like for a week. I was like, no clouds, no clouds, no clouds on Monday, no clouds on Monday. I wanted to see that yeah, eclipse. Yeah, yeah. What a bummer that would have been, right? I think I had a couple friends who like just because of wherever they were, there was happened to be like a little cloud right over it, and they were saying, no, no, no. Yeah. seriously, uh -huh. like right at the moment the eclipse, the cloud came yeah, over, just oh. for like five or ten minutes before it and after it, and then it like went away. Oh, that would be such a bummer. Like, the thing is, seeing it in video is just not doesn't do it justice. Well, and I I tried to take a picture, just even though they're like telling you can't, you just do it anyway because you're like, oh, I'm just gonna yeah. see. Maybe they're Maybe. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna try it anyway, and then and no, mm -mm, no, it looks like a big blob. It yeah. just was like a big bright blob. Yeah. You know. It looks as stupid as all my other pictures of cool stuff that I try to do. Have you ever tried to take a picture of the moon? Yeah, it's oh. impossible. And the moon's like, like there's times where the moon's big and orange, and you're like, yeah. wow, look at it. And then you're like, I'm going to take a picture. And you're like, it's, it was really big and orange. You see, look at it. See? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I promise it looked really neat when I first saw it. Oh, we have people joining us. Let's see who's with us today. There's Kurt Parker. Hi, Kurt. You want me to like straighten this out a little bit? Why not? You don't like it crooked? I, I, I tried to make OCD it. About I this. tried to straighten it out, but I wasn't very good at it. Okay, don't breathe go. too hard or anything. Don't talk. Yeah. It's going to be a really bad podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, speaking of talking, can I get a quick sound check from you? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Cool. Have you always wanted to do that? Shape, so. Are you ready to rock and roll? Okay, oh. so oh, we need to. Get, so we'll have a time clock up there. Okay. And he puts it at nine, so we want to stay around nine or ten minutes. Okay. But if we go a little over, it's okay. Sure. We don't. We don't have to. You know. But I'll just kind of like wrap. I'll kind of like okay. okay we're gonna take a quick break, and then um, and then we'll do two, nine ten minutes. We're just chatting, and then we'll do one at the end. That's where I get to ask you some. It was hard to think of questions to ask okay. you. I might yeah. be changing these questions as we go. I was like, I do not know that I know. I'm going to learn a lot from you today because I really don't get exactly what you do. So this is super exciting okay. for me. So I might just, like, we'll just figure it out. We always do. We figure it out. And, oh, and we're recording it other than being sure. live on here. But if you misspoke about something and say hey wait that doesn't because i do it all the time sure. I'll, I'll like start and fumble and go wait i gotta do it again okay, that's fine. <laughs> so it's kind of the fun part for all the people watching us live that we're like this is what it looks like all right are you ready it's all smoke and mirrors okay i am ready when you are Hi, this is Mish Hancock, and you are listening to Mishmash, a place where I get to talk to the weird, wacky, wonderful people of this world, people I adore and want to know more about. Today, my guest is Ness Sandoval. He's an associate professor of sociology at St. Louis University. His primary research focuses on the intersection of demographic techniques and computational spatial science to study spatial inequality in American cities. Welcome, Ness. Thank you for inviting me. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. So, what did I just say? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is an exciting area of research um, that's emerged in the past 15 to 20 years because of the change in technology. Okay. And um, so the ideas that we're trying to uh, incorporate in our research are not necessarily new ideas. Many of the statistics that we try to apply to um, our studies have been around for many decades. But because uh, they're very complicated, uh, it was very difficult to do it by hand. Yeah, yeah. 
And so what happened right around uh, 1996, 97, was a, a change with the Windows environment, going from DOS to Windows, and people um, creating software programs that were trying to incorporate the statistics into maps. Okay. And so um, we still had problems with computers, though, because computers were still slow. Um, the memory was very small, and so you, we still had limitations. Right. But as computers got better and they got cheaper, they were, they were becoming more accessible to professors and, and other individuals, and people started to see what we could do. And um, with each generation of computers, we got better and faster computers and more memory. And then we got smarter people to create the software programs. And so <clears throat> this is where the comp computational spatial science came into it because the first part of this is where we can make nice maps. This is right. this was really something that was that was different. And, and I got, I have to say I, I I was stalking you a little bit, you know, so I could understand <laughs> everything. And but your Twitter feed was so cool because it's maps, 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 yeah. just maps of all kinds of, of you know different with different information. It was really interesting to me. Yeah, so we so we make a distinction between um, why maps are important. Um, but the spatial, so there's, there's two components here when you, when you kind of think about um, the work that we do. One is making a map for people to kind of understand what's happening in your neighborhood or what's happening in the city or in the metropolitan region. And that's important. But the second part where, where we're going with, uh, with our work today and in the future is within that map is information. And um, for us, we want to understand how important that information is in helping us understand social or economic, environmental, or ecological phenomena there. So we can start to create maps where we're looking at multiple variables at the same time. Okay. So oftentimes these maps are very difficult. So what we do is we do the analysis in the background, and then we're able to make a map of this very detailed um, statistical model that's there. And this is what's new. This is this is um, really in the past ten years, we've been able to advance this field in terms of looking at multiple variables within the map, but also trying to understand um, how we think about these relationships. And so, part of what I argue um, in the work that I do is that we all understand space, whether right. we, we kind of think about it. We all kind of we can look at a Google map and be like, okay, this is where I live and this is where I work. This is the road I'm taking. So we kind of understand this space, right? <clears throat> but when we look at maps, when we look at the maps as just a map, there are boundaries that are predefined. Right. Right? So these boundaries typically are provided by the U.S. Census or the metropolitan governments. And they're boundaries of neighborhoods, they're boundaries of political wards, of crime mapping districts that are important, zip codes, counties, your own boundary of your city. So we kind of understand, we, we're always trying to understand our own space in relationship to these boundaries. And so what we've been trying to think about is um, those boundaries are important, right? but are they really masking the spatial patterns that exist within the boundaries? So is this where the spatial inequality comes in? And yeah, it's so an interesting this, term, yeah. you know, so what does that mean, mean spatial inequality? So we, so as a sociologist, as a demographer, um, we study society. And one of the paradigms of society, society is class. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, so there's, a, there's a hierarchy in society. I mean, you have your, you have your top, your middle, and your, your working class. And we look at occupation, and we look at education. Uh, we look at prestige and, and so forth. So we just we know from all the work we've been doing is that this is very important. This this hierarchy. But we started to ask the question: Is this how is this hierarchy distributed throughout space? Is it randomly distributed throughout space, or do we see a hierarchy, uh, a spatial, what we would call a spatial hierarchy, and within that spatial hierarchy, um, we see what we call opportunity structures cluster around this hierarchy. So I'm going to stop you. 
Opportunity structures, what does that mean? So opportunity structures is your access to jobs, uh -huh. your access to quality education, your access to transportation. So within, if you live in a metropolitan region, you have all these opportunities. Right. Based on where you live, what type of access do you have? Because not everybody has the same access to the same. That makes complete <clears throat> sense. And so we, I started to work on this when I was um, a PhD student at UC Berkeley because we really started to see that people had different access to the greater metropolitan opportunity structure if you had a private, we call it private mobility, so if you had your own car. Right. Versus if you were reliant on public transportation. Yes. You could only access certain types of jobs and certain types of entertainment and certain types of health care if you're relying on the bus or on, on public transportation. Well, and even, the, even you think of like grocery stores. You know, there are people that they, they can get to the little corner 7-Eleven type place that is not going to be the best food. Sure. And, and also often higher price. You, you, if you're going to get milk at the little corner store, it's going to cost a heck of a lot more than what you can get at a grocery store. So this is not new. People have been talking about this right. for, for many decades. Sociologists and demographers have been talking about this. Um, but how we kind of understand our opportunity structures is kind of based on what people believe they have access to. Now, we map, we map these opportunity structures using these predefined boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of look at clusters of places that have great opportunity and clusters where the opportunity is limited. And then we start to get into this um, debate about how did that happen? And the, for a region like St. Louis, which is uh, car dependent, yes. if you have no car, then you, and you live in an area that has poor transportation, you're not gonna have access to the same opportunity structure that somebody who lives in another neighborhood that has access to public transportation but does not have a car, they're just going to have a different opportunity structure. Gotcha. And so we, we look at this and say, well, that, that's a form of inequality. Now the question is the magnitude of the inequality and what does the quality actually mean for a person who's very young versus somebody who's uh, over 65. So we look at the live course and saying, well, maybe 65, you're, the things that you're looking for are health care, access to a doctor, access to good food. Uh, if you're young, you're looking for access to quality education, access to parks. Um, and so, so we, we have to take into account the different demographic characteristics. And so that's the intersection between the demography and space. Gotcha. Is that we all go through different demographic transitions as we age. And so right. things that are important for me now were different when I w was 18. Exactly. I was, had a different, <clears throat> I was looking for different things in my metropolitan region. So this is interesting. We're gonna, we're gonna take a quick break because I've got all kinds of questions sure. coming up right now. <laughs> we will be right back with Ness. Cool. Do a little editing real quick. Edit, 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 edit. <laughs> oh, that goes back to fast, huh? It always does. It always does. <laughs> it's like, yeah. for it's like, like two or three yeah. minutes. It's like, oh, okay, we're done. <laughs> hey, my mom's there. Hi, mom. <laughs> and Sandy. Hi, Sandy. He wants to get to look and see who's saying hello to us today. You'll meet my mom. Good. She Good. helps us. She's she, my mom and my dad are always in the green room at the uh, TEDx events. So great. They kind of host that room and make sure everybody's happy and well fed and well hydrated Good. <laughs> <laughs> for that whole speaking thing. So will you be there tonight too at the meeting tonight? Or? I am not going to okay. make it tonight. No, I'm not. But Elaine and and Elaine will be there yeah. for sure. Yeah. And I don't know if Steve will be there or not. What is tonight's thing? It's the PowerPoint, the visual is the right. Visual. Oh, and that's by Coca, right? Coca's yeah. Got, oh yeah, that'll be that's always. So helpful. that's the last part I have to. I have some, I have some visuals I think I'm going to use, but I want to wait until um, after tonight to kind yeah. of make that decision. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, you're getting a class on it. I yeah. think that's the that's the first time we're doing that class. That'll be a cool good, class. Good, yeah. yeah, I'm doing a presentation next month, and so I put, I put my. PowerPoint together for that. I wanted to, and it was, you know, that came out for a while that, um, oh, no, I can't remember it. It, was, it kind of had like an animation kind of thing going on with it. 
But it was such a pain in the butt to work is with. Is it the one that, that goes in and out? Yes. Yeah. What is it called? It's, it's the nonlinear I loved the idea of it, and I and I really wanted to work with it, but you, you were a lot reliant on way too many things. I mean, PowerPoint's difficult enough, yeah. right? To, you're reliant on certain things for that, to make that happen. Yeah. That was reliant on too many other yeah, things, and it just was... that you have a nonlinear story that you want to tell. It didn't go off in the middle of our thing. I gotta turn that off. Where, sorry everybody. Got it. You gotta get to look at the ceiling here. And my hand. All right, we are back. We're back. We're back. Cool. Forgot to turn my phone off. Hello, everyone. We are back now. Um. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it. It was like hot. People wanted to do it, and yeah. and then and I tried it, and I was like, "This is making me crazy to try to make this." And it, it was such a great concept, but it wasn't intuitive enough for me. I needed it to be, yeah. like. Click this button, click that button, click that. Yeah, there you go. You it got was a presentation. very popular two years ago <laughs> on campus. Everybody wanted to do it. Well, because it is cool. But, you know, hi, Cecilia. Now we're kind of crooked, but uh, we'll be a little crooked. You want me to read? Do you want to uncrooked us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's not audio, only the audio engineer. Yeah. <laughs> He's also <laughs> messing with Mish's phone and right. oh, Mish, the things I got to do to make you right. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. For you ready? Segment. All right. And you're listening to Mish Mash. We are back with Ness Sandoval and we are talking about spatial inequality and so many interesting things. So, my question for you. Do people, like, would, would a government hire you as an example? Like, we need to put in a new transportation system for our area. And, like, would they work with you to help them figure out what areas are in the greatest need? But they have their own. Most government agencies have their own division. Okay. Where they, where they do this. Um, so, yeah, so we oftentimes we will um, exchange ideas. We make presentations on work that we're doing. Um, so it really depends on which part of the government. So for in terms of transportation, they're very well funded. Okay. So they have have hired their own in-house um, gotcha. individuals to to create these uh, maps and to, to do the type of that analysis that they want. Other government agencies do reach out to us because they just don't have the capacity. And so part of the mission that we have at SLU through our lab is that we want to empower people. And we want to help them understand how they can incorporate maps and, spatial, and a spatial analysis into a better understanding of how they better can serve their clients, how they can think about their neighborhood and envision a future mm -hmm. of uh, what the neighborhood could be based on the different types of inequalities that, that may be present in their neighborhood. Wow. So what's it, is it, what project are you working on right now? Is there a project you're working on right now that's really exciting? So we have a couple different projects um, that we're working on. We're working on a project where we're mapping out um, services that have been provided by a nonprofit, a, a nonprofit group of lawyers. And they try to get a, get a sense of the types of cases that they have based on the location. And Interesting. So, in this place, is it mostly immigration cases, or in place A, is it mostly uh, divorce, or is it place C, is it housing and foreclosure? So they want to get a sense of um, are there patterns that they're starting to see within the types of clients that they work with, and um, to get a sense of how they need to reallocate their resources okay. to kind of meet the demand that they're seeing internally there so we're we're in the process of um, creating some maps for them to get a sense of um, the the differences in the clientele that they have based on the data that they, they were able to show with that's them. cool and, and so we're able and, and to so this is is, it, is this a group of lawyers or is it a private law firm or so it's a non it's a non-profit organization okay gotcha yeah. gotcha okay and so um so that's that's one project and we, then we do a lot of work with mosaic Oh, and yeah, we so, love yeah, that. So, yeah, we, so um, <laughs> we're constantly providing uh, at least twice a year, sometimes three to four times a year, updates on what's happening with the immigrant population. 
Um, so they get this profile, but we also make a map because we have a very large metropolitan region. And so the map kind of, so they have this global number of this is how many immigrants are coming in and right. this is our increase. And then we're able to show this map by county and we can do it within the county, uh, which counties are gaining uh, population in terms of immigrants and which counties are losing. Um, and then we can do that within the county. So we, we're doing some work on immigrant enclaves. And so one of the interesting things is, um, so St. Louis doesn't have a very large immigrant population to begin with. Right. But we do have immigrant enclaves. Yes, we, we do. And so this, is, this has been a shock, I think, for a lot of people because they're always thinking, well, St. Louis, we, have a, we don't have an immigrant population, so we're not going to have these immigrant enclaves. And then I created this map that says, you know, in fact, you have, we have about 13 of them. Um, based on um, cities right. in the, in the right. region that, are, that would qualify as an immigrant enclave. And I think people are shocked because when they see this map, they're like, oh my gosh, Maryland Heights is an immigrant enclave. Oh. All of its city is an immigrant enclave. And so they see this on the map and they go, I know this area. I know what's happening in Mar Maryland Heights. I know what's happening in all of its city. Do you think some of it is because, because I've thought of this before, like, is some of it because it's it's so contained in one area? You know, how, I mean, you know how it is. Like you're you're used to doing. You go here. This yeah. is where you shop. This is where you go. And so you don't see some. So you, we get areas. these clusters. Yeah. So the yeah. question for us is, um, I'm not saying necessarily the clusters good or bad. And the, the question is, how do these clusters happen? Right. Who's living in the clusters? And so we would see that this may be a cluster where it's got a very large Bosnian population. And so we would expect, based on immigrant enclaves, that that's a natural social formation of, of um, social capital working together. And Maryland Heights and Creep Corps, uh, all of its city in that area, it's about far more diverse, but you have to get a very large Indian, mm -hmm. uh, Chinese uh, population. Then you get areas where you get a very large Mexican population, right? So for us, it kind of t not all immigrant enclaves are the same. Some are very diverse, some are very homogeneous. You have Fairmont uh, City here, which is a Mexican immigrant enclave. Um, so it's not very diverse. And so that's right. very different than Maryland Heights, which is very diverse. And so we, so we have these maps, but then we drill in within the maps and say, what's, what's important to try to understand why this map is coming out and, right. and showing that there's a cluster there. Or is it sometimes just like a person, like somebody moved there and then somebody else moved there and so, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like is it, is it just because somebody moved there, the, this is good, this is comfy, come on over, you know? Yeah, and so, uh, so the, I would say from, a, from, a, from my perspective, uh, as more immigrants move into the state, into the region, we're gonna start to see more areas become immigrant enclaves um, um, uh, I think that most of them are going to be in the suburbs. Uh, but then we can get down to the neighborhood level and saying, okay, I don't want to look at the cities. Right. But how many neighborhoods are immigrant enclave neighborhoods? And so here we get very detailed um, analysis of maps. And so I know this block or these sets of blocks, if we use census tracts, would be classified as an immigrant neighborhood. Okay. Versus an immigrant uh, enclave city. And so that would be so, so cool. To, I mean, because that'd be so cool to know. Then you know where the authentic restaurants are. Yeah, then you kind of get a sense of. <laughs> well, you know a, what I mean, a, though? I mean, I would love to have like an enclave field trip. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So we have, I have a student who uh, was working on this, and so we started to explore this and trying to get a sense of um, do the people who own the restaurants live in the neighborhood or are they traveling? And, and so there's there's lots of work to be done now. And this but this could not be done fifteen years ago because the data was the data was simply not there. Um, the US government really changed the census and they okay. went to the American Community Survey. And because of that, uh, they started to ask different types of questions. And so somebody who's interested in immigrant research the types of questions we can ask now related to space is very different compared to the 2010 census. And so um, we can we can look at uh, age of immigrants and citizenship status, mm -hmm. the language ability of immigrants and citizenship status by, by place. And so 
we have the ability to make very unique maps now. Oh, cool. That we were not able to do uh, when the 2000 census was, or the 1990 census. There you're kind of limited in terms of the types of maps you can do. So, so there's been a revolution, not only in terms of technology, but in terms of data transparency and uh, asking more more types of questions that are there. And so that's just it's the richer. government. Yeah. You can get a lot more information now. Is, is yeah. that it? And one of the things we discover is that organizations are collecting their own data. We're working oh. with them to kind of help them understand. You realize that you have data that you can put on a map. Cool. They may not know how to do it, but we come in and we provide, um, we work as partners, and we help them take their data and put it on a map. And, and this initially to show them this is, this is, your clients. I love and that and then plus it's easier, right, if you have that visual yeah. of the map. And they're and they're surprised and like I had no idea that people were traveling forty miles to come to visit us. I mean they were able to develop oh, what's called a commute wow. shed to see how far people were coming just to get services from that agency. And then that can help them to understand if they should have like a little satellite yeah, exactly. somewhere. Yeah. Oh that's or, or the reverse they can help them kind of understand well, like with one of the clients, they're like, we are, we are really a neighborhood-based organization, and we really need to go back to our grassroots uh -huh. and focus on the clients that live in our neighborhood. And, and so it, it can go both ways uh, in terms of really trying to be true to the mission of the organization. So Got the maps yeah. kind of help them understand uh, where they're at, are they, are they true to their mission, and then what's happening. So wow. this is kind of exciting. So interesting. All right, we will be back with Ness in just a moment. That is so interesting. Okay, now I get it. I was like, I'm going to say this, these words. <laughs> and I don't really know what I'm asking this person yeah. yet. So it was fun coming up with, what's, what questions shall I ask at the end? I mean, all within your wheelhouse, of course. But, um, yeah, I think I think these will... I'm ready when you are, Sam. Where's the meeting at tonight? Is it at T-Rex? I believe it's at... I gotta double check. Yeah, it is. This is one of those weeks where I have so many things going on at night. I was like, I have to pick and choose where I can be tonight. You're in great hands with Elaine, though. She she was at my house. Oh, okay. For the eclipse, very, yeah. Very, she very. came. Up. She had she made really good peach cobbler, so you can like say, oh, you sh Nish has been raving about peach cobbler. It was so good. I had two servings of it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm ready. Are, you? Are we ready? I'm ready. And we are back with Ness Sandoval. We're talking about spatial inequality in American cities. And I've got some questions for sure. you. Okay, so as just the regular old person out here, can I myself, can I apply this to my own neighborhood? Like, are Absolutely. there tools for me? Absolutely. So All right, we, tell me how. So we, uh, there, are, there are a couple different options. So one option is um, every year we offer uh, a spatial inequality workshop on campus that's free to the public and so we typically send out an email and we invite people to come to campus and to come and learn how to make maps of their neighborhoods to get data that they're interested in and so we do that for free cool and where so do people sign up so they have to they'll have to send me an email and say okay. that they've heard about this and that they would like to participate in the workshop uh, we typically do the work, we do them a couple times, uh, we do at least once a year, and then sometimes we do, um, when there's a high demand, if there's a special topic coming on, we'll, we'll do a, a special topic type workshop, like a hackathon. Oh, cool. And they, we're going to devote four hours to this topic because it's been important in the news. Um, but if they send me an email, I put them on a the list, and then I'll send that uh, email out that says, okay, here's the date. It's typically from uh, 9 to 12 on a Friday, typically in April. Okay. Sometimes we have one in May, and, and then we do a, a summer workshop um, as well. Um, so that, that's one way. And then you teach people how to do it. Absolutely. Like on, on their own. That's so what we're awesome. able to do is, um, because we're a university, we have access to uh, a couple different software programs 
that would cost money. Right, got you. And so the nice thing about the soccer programs is that uh, they're, they're cloud-based. And so the the ability to make maps is pretty much like driving a mouse on Google Maps. Right? Okay. You just, like, this is what I want. I want a couple clicks here, and then, then I want to zoom in, and there's your neighborhood. And so you may say, I want a map. I want to see what the racial composition of my neighborhood is. Like, you can get down to your to your block. Right. And we can make that map probably in 30 seconds now. Really? Yeah. Oh, how interesting. And then you can, I, I teach people how to save the maps, and then you can share the maps on Facebook and on Twitter, and, and you can do things. What, what people we find interesting with the workshops, though, is they, and this is where, I think, when we started our conversation. Right. The data behind the maps is probably even more important than the map itself. Right. So they come in, like, oh, I love this map. Can I have the data? And because we're offering a, this workshop, they can download the data uh, in seconds, like, you know, like 30 seconds. Now, you can do this for free, um, but it's a, it's a little bit more work if you do it on your own through the U.S. Census, okay. American Fact Finder. Um, and so they have, a, they have an interactive um, website as well. And oh, then right. um, it's called GeoFred. It's the Federal Reserve here at St. Louis. They also have an interactive uh, mapping software that allows you to look at social and economic indicators. Very cool. But where we're going with this is the map is nice. Right. But we actually want to the do mean? the spatial statistics of identifying within that map, what should I be looking at? Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so that's, that's what we do. That's cool. Yeah. That's a cool offering, that class. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Um, the most surprising or unexpected fact you ever learned from this work just something you were like whoa did not even think that was going to occur or happen or be the most surprising thing that I have learned from this is um, well there's, there's just so many I think um, we do a lot of work on um, our ability to take satellite images and convert these into data Ooh. And so what we are able to do now is um, what, would, what, what appears to be a Google image, we can take that image and we can now create maps of quality of trees, tree coverage, uh, different types of vegetation, and very detailed maps. We're breaking it maps down to um, meter by meter. Really? And so we, uh, so part of this, part of what we were doing is um, looking at ecological inequality, right? We want to see how healthy is the city in terms of trees, tree coverage, because this is important. Because this is a huge thing with all, like, neighbor, new neighborhoods going up all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you, have, if you have this forest preserve and then you tear all the trees down to build a housing development or to build a shopping center, what's the impact? What's the ecological impact? Right. So we're able to kind of really do this now and... And um, so for me, if you were to ask, we knew we could do this. This was, this was something we've been doing for a while. But the ease that we can do it now, it's, 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 you can, it's accessible to people. Right. Where 15 years ago, 20 years ago, to do this was really in the hands of experts. And now what we're, I think for me, the surprising fact is how easy we are able to help users absorb this technology and you can do this i mean as long as there's a google map you can you well, can figure out the vegetation of that area and what well, have it, you i use google map as an example okay so behind that google maps is the satellite, the satellite image. Image. so we have to go okay. to the actual satellite image gotcha. itself and so these these are available and the satellite that will that gets all that data yeah oh, and so you can go back in time stuff. so we wow. are working with a phd student right now and we're analyzing 72 metropolitan regions, and we're analyzing the quality of vegetation from 1990 through 2010, and looking at the role, the time plays. But now we're looking at the role of economic inequality in, in these neighborhoods, because we, we have it by 1,000 uh, meter by 1,000 meter grids. Got ya. That's amazing. And so we, we were able to get all of our data into these grids, and 
and it's a map that most people are not familiar with because when they see a map, it's they see a map of census tracts or a map of their own neighborhood, right? Or counties, and like, oh, that's a grid. It's a thousand meter by thousand meter grid, and like, yeah, that's that's kind of, and you can go down. When we work with crime. We do we do work with crime. Some people want it by fifty meters by fifty meters, and I think this has been shocking to see the crime maps. Yeah. That are at that level of detail versus a crime map of neighborhood boundaries because you're like, oh my gosh, that neighborhood boundary map is showing all these neighborhoods as high crime neighborhoods. But the way that you're showing it is, it's really these pockets. Yeah, it's like this city one tiny little area that are, are the magnets of, of different types of crime. And it just has a different reorientation to how you understand inequality. Does does this apply to animal life as well? So you can do it for animal life. So so uh, so I know some biologists who one of my colleagues studies fish, and looks at how fish swim in the Missouri, oh, in the Mississippi cool. River, and he's looking at the the depth of fish. And so you can do this with biology. I know of other people that do. Uh, they put GPS trackers on animals to try to get a sense of the range of where they're going. Right. So it's not my area of research, but. Uh, so as long as we have with technology today, with my with our cell phones, um, with Twitter, we're doing some work on Twitter, uh, trying to keep a sense of when people tweet, where are they tweeting? Because we know exactly if they if they have the location service on, we know the X Y coordinate of where they tweeted. Right. So if I did a tweet here in the studio, it would say that Ness Sandoval tweeted, and then I have the content of my t tweet, and so I can download this for free. And I say, well, I want to see what people were tweeting about during the eclipse. Yeah, right. And then I want to create a map of the themes that were emerging across the region. And let's say, well, maybe where you were living, they were tweeting about um, something, something, right? Yeah. Clouds. Maybe yeah. there were clouds there. Clouds, or, and or what the shadows tweeting, right? look like. Or, and so right. you can have a map and say, well, in this area, people were kind of disappointed because they were not able to see the total eclipse. Right. And in this area, they were able to see it. That is and fascinating. So this is, there are some really interesting maps coming out with Twitter. You can't, we can't really do this necessarily with Facebook because Facebook's data is private. So you have to get, right. them, you have to have an arrangement with Facebook for them to share this. But Twitter yeah. has decided that it's going to be open, and you can download it, and, and you can map it, and, and then you can do some interesting social network network analysis and so how cool yeah. well that's so that would explain why you're so active on twitter yeah. <laughs> okay one more so one more question really it's it, do you have a favorite type of map like is there a map that you just like this map rocks out <laughs> so i have a map one that one map that i like to sh to show is a map of um, what we, a research project called um it's on, on latino cities Latino majority cities. Where are you from? Where, so where I'm you... originally from, well, I was born in Denver, Colorado, but okay. I grew up in Nebraska in Scotts Bluff, which is on the western side near um, Wyoming. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And so I grew up in a community that had a very large Mexican population. So, okay. so I've always tried to understand how this happened. Is my community unique? For, for Nebraska, uh, my community was, was unique to have that large of a Mexican population. Really? Yeah. All right. It's about 30%. Plus or minus a percent, so that's that's unique for Nebraska. Okay, um, but I have this map of the entire United States that I made that shows every um, place that the U.S. C classifies as a place. So it could be like Creve Core, all of its city, Maryland Heights. It's got an official designation by the U.S. Census that has a Latino majority population in it, and then I break that map. It says, well, there, it's at least 50% of the residents there are Latino majority. And then I have a, part of the map shows cities that have 75%. Okay. And so I, I remember, and I, I'll never forget this. So I, I shared this map on Facebook and on Twitter and said, these are, all, these are all the places that are now officially Latino majority. And then somebody says, that map's wrong because you're saying something somewhere in St. Louis. You're saying St. Louis is Latino majority. I was like, no. There's a, there's a suburb in St. Louis that's Latino. And they're like, which suburb? And I said, it's Fairmont. And like, oh, yeah. And it, so for that, it hit them. But then they were surprised to find out that Missouri had other cities, places, that, that were Latino majority. Interesting. Iowa had places. Nebraska has places. 
And so we tend not to think about that because they get lost in these county maps. Right. And so at a county level, yeah, they don't exist. But because we're able to map this out, we see places in Mrs. in uh, Georgia. Uh, like, well, what's going on in Georgia? And we see places in uh, Montana and Oregon and Washington that are Latino majority. And so for, for people, they're like, wow, this is really happening. Right. And so so the the next extension of this is what's going on in these places. Yeah, what's, why why is there exactly? Is this driven by immigration? And for some cities like Fairmont, yes, it is. And other cities, it's not. It's driven by babies being born. Interesting. And so this is where I put my demography hat on and saying, okay, what's the demographic transition here? you got places that are very young, um, like Noel here in, in Missouri. And um, so the next 15, 20 years, that's going to be very different because of the change in the population. So that's that's one of my favorite maps because this, it kind of starts a dialogue that people aren't used to having right. this dialogue. Um, but it's, I find I like that map. Well, I lo- oh, fascinating stuff, sir. Thank you Thank so you. much Thank for, for sharing me. this with us. And you're one of our TEDx Gateway Arch speakers for October yes, 27th. I'm excited. So I know that you're just in the, the very beginning of putting your talk together. But I we appreciate you doing this. I'm excited, I'm excited. to hear your talk. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very Ness. much. And you all have been listening to Mishmash. Please go to iTunes and subscribe. We will catch you next time. That is fascinating. So you've done, you have like a whole different view of the world than most people. Then, because I try, you know, I because see you data, see yeah. things and so, you know, you. I, I just that's interesting. Yeah, I like to look at. I like like what does that mean spatially? Right. Um, and how can we how can we visualize this in different ways? And, and is your talk going to be St. Louis centric or? Are you it's going to be St. Louis centric. So, um, yeah. So I'm going to talk about the history of a little bit of history of racial. Well, I'm going to talk about racial segregation in the city. And then kind of how we talk about the, the shrinking city yeah. problem and yeah. kind of how we work with community organizations to, to think about ways to um, collect data to visualize what's, what's happening in, in these areas. Very cool. Oh, I can't wait to see. Well, thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank this you. is fun. This is awesome. It goes by Bye, so fast. Bye, everybody. We'll be back in a bit.